Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ryan, and welcome to Central Park. As always, getting to Central Park, even as the weather gets nicer, can still be pretty difficult for a lot of us. So we want to continue making it easier by bringing the park to you through both our in-person tours, as well as our virtual programs, our longer 45-minute programs, as well as our shorter, more informal 15-minute weekly walks, which we're going to be taking today. I do want to thank you again for joining us and welcome you to Central Park. Today, we have a fun little weekly walk of Shakespeare Garden with me, Ryan, on today, May 25th, 2022. And on our walk today, we are going to answer the age-old question, do April showers actually bring May flowers? So we're going to begin our walk. I want to again thank you for supporting us here at the Central Park Conservancy. At this point, you're probably a little familiar with who we are and what we do. We're the nonprofit private organization that's been caring for the park since 1980, preserving and celebrating Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing enjoyment and well being of all, helping to raise. This is about 75 percent looking beautiful for all to enjoy. We do want to thank you again for joining us, and we want to encourage you to, again, enjoy these walks. If you do want to use the chat feature, please maybe let us know where you're joining us from. But we do just want to remind everybody that these virtual programs, much like when you visit the park or come on an in-person tour, are going to be safe spaces. And we do want to make sure that we're being respectful in the chat of both each other, as well as maybe avoiding the constant pop-ups so those that are trying to enjoy the program can watch it. So again, please use the chat minimally as you would like to say hello and let us know where you're joining us from, but please use the Q&A feature if you do have a question or want to get something answered. Last thing you'll see pop up on our screen are going to be some visitor polls I'll launch throughout the walk. And once everybody has voted, I'll share those results and we can see what everybody's thinking. You also will notice the live transcripts are again in use. You do want to turn those off. You can if you go to the live transcript. Um, icon on your Zoom menu bar. You'll see it pictured on this picture on the very bottom right. Uh, you can disable those and turn those off, but please use the Q&A feature if you have a question. And my uh, colleague, Alan, who's on the back end, can hopefully help you either turn those off or answer the questions. Any unanswered questions, I'll get to you at the end of the walk. So thank you for your patience as we begin our weekly walk, starting over at West 86th Street and 8th Avenue, otherwise known as Central Park West. And we're going to make our way through the park on a somewhat damp day. But again, even a damp, wet, or overcast day in Central Park is still a better day than in the city, in my opinion, at least. As we enter the park at this lesser utilized landscape, we're coming in at 86th Street and again, walking in after a little bit of uh, wet rain. But luckily, no rain as we walk into the park, and we're instead getting a lot of bright colors coming out. I love these overcast days because I feel like it makes colors contrast a little bit more, especially against all the green that's coming in. And we can, of course, see plenty of blooms on our way over to Shakespeare Garden, but plenty of beautiful different shades of green to admire along the way. And as we glance over to our left, up towards the north end of the park, we can see some of the nice open lawns and landscapes that exist around this western side. And what we can also notice from afar is something kind of stuck in the middle of this lawn. If we look a little bit closer, we can see it's a red flag. As many of you may know, red flags are utilized to let us know that lawns, ball fields, and different areas of the park are closed. Many of these lawns and landscapes getting closed after rainfall because soil like this and grass and turf is more susceptible to damage after it's wet. So we will close some of these lawns off to make sure they're nice and pristine for the rest of the summer month. And of course, as we move along the park, even though some lawns are closed, others are open. And we can see some of the school groups that are certainly not letting the rain affect their fun time in the park, utilize some of the open lawns over here. I believe this group was doing a fun little three-legged uh, race as we walked by, something I haven't seen happening in a while. But again, as we start to get past the pandemic, we're seeing the park really return to normal, school groups, tourism, all these fun events occurring in the park. And even again, on a rainy day, there's always something to see happening. As we continue crossing the West Side Drive, we'll make our way over briefly to the bridle path. And as we start making our way down the park, we're again seeing some colors as we come through, but we're gonna see a lot of explosive colors coming out once we get to Shakespeare Garden. As we make our way down the path, I do wanna launch the first poll just to uh, leave up for a little bit. And that is, what's your favorite spring color to see? 
Um, of course, there's so many colors and I can't fit them all on here, but just in general, I wanna see if anybody leans a specific way. I know there's a specific color or shade that is a favorable, preferable color for me, but we'll see if it's the same one. While everybody votes on that, we'll continue down the path, coming near the author Ross Pinedo. And as we continue down the path a little bit, we pass by some of the different signs that sit along the Seneca Village site. Seneca Village being a predominantly, or what was a predominantly African-American community located near the West 85th Street area of the park. You can find some signs located around about 17 or so that tell you a lot more information about this community and surrounding landscape things like geology. This geology sign appropriately is located near a really interesting piece of bedrock that we can go walk over to. And as we make our way over, we can see some of the fun mysteries that occur or that really are found within this rock. Just any rock we pass through in the park Take a moment to look over it, be a little mindful of it. You never know what you're going to find. Maybe some either natural or human constructed drill holes. We might see some different types of iron beams or uh, markings that are placed in there. Sometimes grid markers. We actually can find an original 1811 grid marker somewhere in Central Park, as well as some various other surveying marks like this. And even some that are really showing some of the deep geology of this rock like this nice S kind of uh, snake kind of patch of what I believe is some type of granite. If you're having trouble seeing that, I can uh, pull up this little highlight, which will show you that patch of granite that's just kind of running through this Manhattan schist, which is the 450 million year old bedrock of New York and the second oldest bedrock to find in New York City. But really fun discoveries to find in here. You might also notice some other kind of mysteries, like some Central Park Conservancy survey control marks. We have a few of these monuments that are placed throughout the park. And actually there's so many different surveying marks throughout the park, it's hard to find out what they all mean. This is one that I'm actually not definitively sure as to what it's locating or marking. So I actually still have to do a little bit of research to find out the origin of this. This is found around about 84th Street and sort of in line with 7th Avenue, which leads me to believe this might be a general marker kind of showing us where part of the original uh, receiving reservoir wall was. For those who are familiar, the Great Lawn in Central Park used to be the receiving reservoir, otherwise known as the Yorkville Reservoir, part of the Croton Aqueduct water system, which of course was taken out around the 1930s. So it's really interesting to see some of these monuments and markers, some of which we know what are from, some of which I've yet to find out. So always something new to learn in the park. And as we start making our way past the Arthur Ross Pine Edom playground area and where this nice little rock is, we'll continue walking along the western edge of the Great Lawn, which as I just mentioned, used to be the Yorkville Reservoir, completed back in 1842. As we continue walking back in present 21st century, we'll continue walking along that again, west side of the reservoir, or west side of the Great Lawn today. And as we make our way down, we can see some of the beautiful pine trees that are spilling out from the Arthur Ross Pinetum, which began back in the 1970s and has expanded every year since. Today, incorporating 17, upwards of 17 different species of pine trees and taking up about a four or five acre range with some of my favorites like this Tan Yosho pine being found along our walk of the western side. A really beautiful little tree to see. It reminds me of like a larger than life bonsai tree. As we continue walking down, we'll come out to a lesser used little picnic site here along Great Lawn. And these areas are always fun to explore to switch up your walk and find areas you haven't really previously visited. As you come over around this area, you can find some of the only picnic tables that I'm aware of that exist in Central Park. These um, these picnic tables are, of course, really functional for people that want to come in and picnic. And we might see some of these interesting long, um, long hanging picnic tables. You've ever wondered what these are for? These are more accessible picnic tables that might allow somebody in a wheelchair or somebody in a stroller to come up and join the table, feeling again, a lot more included and providing a lot more accessibility to people in all different accessibility forms. So we do see a couple of these picnic tables found along both the northwest and northeast corners of the Great Lawn. As we continue past this area, we're going to take up a little wood chip trail, one that's probably lesser visited as we make our way down the path. 
I do briefly before we uh, go down this path, want to end the poll and share the results that we have over here. And it's looking like a lot of people I think are choosing one of my favorites, which is purple. So I'm a big fan of like cotton candy type colors, purple, pinks, those kind of mixes, magenta type color, maybe like an Okami cherry probably is my favorite kind of color to see, especially in nature. So I'm certainly with about 27% of us who are voting for purple or even 25% who are voting for pink. It looks like those are two of our favorites, probably because of all the cherry blossom colors we see that certainly fall within that spectrum and that range. So I will end that poll and we're gonna continue walking now down this little woodshed path. And what you'll notice is as we walk down this path, of course, it's a little nondescript of a path. If you actually do look on a map in this area, you won't find this path mapped out, rather just, again, a little wood chip trail running along the side. Like many areas in the park, you have to really experience them in person to learn about some of these different paths and way to get around the park. As we continue walking down this little wood chip path of green, we'll find ourselves popping out right near the Delacorte Theater, which of course is home to Shakespeare in the park, and a lot of our favorite outdoor performances to occur here. I actually don't know what the schedule for this year's Shakespeare in the Park is looking like, but just like you, I'm sure I'm very excited to see what the lineup is gonna be and hopefully get tickets to one or two of the performances. Now, as we continue up past the Delacorte Theater, we are finally making our way along the outskirts of the Shakespeare Garden, which is a nice small um, quaint little about four acre garden that exists right near the west side of Belvedere Castle, very close to the Natural History Museum. And as we walk up the stairs, we can start looking over the just expansive but quaint little hillsides of rocky outcroppings, but just lined with decorative different shades of green. And of course, plenty of different flowers that are popping up after all those April showers. As we start traveling just a little bit up the path, we can make our way up one of, I think, the most interesting set of staircases in the park. These that are carved directly out of the schist. It can be a little slippery during the winter times, but again, I think it's a lot more beautiful having this natural type of design rather than a concrete step like we'd see in a subway station. So coming up these paths, we can be a little careful as we walk up, but of course, enjoy the beautiful walk along this bedrock of New York City. And as we make our way up, we come to just some of these beautiful scenes. Again, lush green that's complemented so well by this overcast, rainy type of weather. As we come to this little alcove or nook located along the eastern edge of Shakespeare's garden, we can find some fun little private areas to read, as well as to sit along the very nice and decorative bench that exists just within this area, the Charles B. Stover bench. Now, Charles B. Stover was a parks commissioner from about 1910 to 1913. He would actually co-found the Outdoor Recreation League around 1898. And uh, during his time working with the city, he would be really instrumental in helping to bring playgrounds and recreational spaces to New York. Um, certainly a few people that have been influential and really helpful in bringing, again, these types of recreation to areas that really need them. We see Charles B. Stover getting a memorial bench placed up here. Uh, this bench coming, I believe, around 19, uh, 1936 or so. Um, this bench being a very interesting one, being placed here because Charles B. Stover certainly really loved and appreciated Shakespeare and would actually be very helpful in getting Shakespeare Garden really created and named Shakespeare Garden. So you see appropriately his memorial bench being constructed just up here, being made of granite and holding a fun little recreational secret. This is one of the two whispering benches in Central Park. So if somebody is to go and whisper in one corner, and another person listens in the other, as long as no one's back is pressed along the edge of this bench, you will hear that perfectly spread and translate through the shape of this arch, which is known as an excedra, a, I believe, Greek type of shape that really just allows this amazing transfer of sound. An excedra, again, that's uh, E-X-E-D-R-A, a really fun little discovery to find up here near Shakespeare Garden. As we continue past the shakes, uh, the Delacorte, or sorry, rather, the Charles B. Stover bench, uh, we'll make our way into the very small but beautiful Shakespeare Garden for our last few stops. And as we start to make our way down the path, we don't even get into the garden yet, and we're already blown away by some of the beauty that exists along the, um, along the outskirts of Shakespeare Garden. 
As we take a little look at some of these, I believe azaleas, which come in many different colors and varieties, we can enjoy my favorite effect of the rainy days, the little water droplets that hang on for dear life to all of the beautiful flowers and blooms we see. This is why during these rainy days, it's one of my favorite times to come into gardens and to look at blooms. As we come into Shakespeare Garden, just along the, what is pretty much the south eastern edge of it, we can walk in on this nice little kind of almost cobblestone-like path, coming into again just a dense layer of green that blocks out where the path twists and turns to. So we'll walk down the path a little bit to find some of the discoveries, as well as having plenty of in uh, fresh, currently blooming plants. There's also plenty that give us something to look forward to in the coming weeks. While there are plenty of blooms occurring right now, there are plenty that will be coming next week, the week after, the week after that. Of course, always something in bloom to see throughout these gardens. As we make our way a little deeper into Shakespeare Garden, we can again appreciate just the history and interesting um, factors of this garden. This is a garden originally created around about uh, 1912. It was created by a gentleman named Edmund Brown who used to be an entomologist or basically a bug scientist operating in what is today the Swedish cottage, a building we'll see in just a little bit. He created this garden primarily putting a lot of Shakespeare mentioned plants and flora in here because of his deep love for Shakespeare. We'd originally see this garden being called the Garden of the Heart, but we would see around 1916 it being renamed Shakespeare Garden in commemoration of the tricentennial of Shakespeare's uh, death. The tricentennial of Shakespeare's death around about April 23rd of 1916. We'd see that official change occurring with Charles B. Stover helping to dedicate this new garden, again, because of his love for Shakespeare. But we can see this garden really beginning thanks to the work of Edmund Bronk, an entomologist and somebody who was a very avid Shakespeare lover, as well as very knowledgeable with a lot of flora, helping to get this garden started, and make it into what it is today. As we come a little bit closer, we can find one of the hidden details within the center of the garden, which is a very interesting sundial. Um, sundials are pretty interesting. Of course, they measure time using the sun. But one thing that's pretty interesting to think about is that sundials really vary depending where they are. Um, in the Eastern time zone, for example, um, well, sundials just in general, don't really take into account things like maybe exactly time zones, um, daylight savings time and things like that. So in the Eastern time zone, sundials actually only measure an accurate time if they're located along the 75 degree west area of the meridian line. Here in New York City, we're actually located around about 74 degrees west on the meridian line, which basically means that all the sundials you would see throughout New York City will be about generally four minutes slow, unless those sundials are made specifically for the degree and point in which they're going to be erected. So a lot of work and science goes into creating and of course dedicating and even putting in the right placement, a sundial in New York. This is an interesting one that of course, because of some of those factors and the trees that cover, don't directly tell us the time anymore, but they offer a really interesting look into the past. This one was said to have been dedicated around 1945, but there's not much information on it. So it is theorized that this one was actually rededicated around 1945 and might've been erected earlier in the park. Um, something we're still trying to research. It's really hard to find information on some of these features. But we would uh, find out that this is created by Walter Beretta, who would help sculpt this beautiful little piece that offers a fun little surprise to find here in Shakespeare Garden. I love seeing some of the little details on it as we look closer. My favorite being the quill and ink that we see over here. Very Shakespearean to have here. As we make our way past this little sundial, we can enjoy some of the, again, water-soaked blooms that exist around, such as this pink flower, which I believe is some type of azalea. Whatever it is, it looks absolutely beautiful. And here's a great color for all those who voted pink in the poll earlier. But as we make our way past, we can also enjoy some of the larger leafy green plants, which are favorites of mine to view in the watery rain. These are Solomon's seal. 
And looking above, below, and all around plants, you'll start to see again some hidden surprises because not all blue, uh, plants bloom and show their flower right up top. Some are gonna make you work for it, like these Solomon seal who have plants and little flowers blooming along the underside of their leaves. So again, remember to look left, right, up, down, and all around because you never know what you're gonna find in the park. As we move past, we can see a favorite of mine. My probably favorite bloom to find in Shakespeare Garden and some other areas of the park are going to be giant onions, otherwise known as um, giant allium. This is gonna be uh, an Asian species of onion. And it of course produces a very big, beautiful purple color bloom. Again, pinks, purple, some of my favorites. These giant alliums are really amazing. They can actually grow up to about five feet tall. So it looks kind of like a giant dandelion that's purple, but a really beautiful and fun plant to see in this garden. As we make our way to our last stop, we can again be thankful of all the blooms we have throughout all different seasons here in the garden. And Shakespeare Garden is a favorite area for us to come and relax and just really enjoy the serenity of the landscape. Looking around again, countless different forms of green and other blooms that are brought on by those May showers. But we can also look to the people who preserve this garden and really make it look so beautiful. This garden would certainly not be what it is today without the help of our head gardener, Larry Bowes, who we can see pictured over here. Uh, Larry has been extremely influential in helping to really preserve this garden. Actually, one of the first tours I ever got to take when I started here at the Conservancy about six years ago was a tour of Shakespeare Garden led by Larry. Um, and he's just extremely knowledgeable and very uh, generous. If you ever do see him in the garden, you can certainly uh, ask him about some of the flowers. I know they get it all the time. What's that flower? What's that flower? But certainly a very um, generous and nice a uh, man who helps to again preserve this garden and keep it looking beautiful. And one of the reasons we have our areas of the park looking so beautiful today is because of something that began back in the 1980s, zone gardening and zone management. This began back with the creation of strawberry fields around 1985. And it might seem common practice today because it typically is, but it was brand new during that time. Zone management means we have one person that's overseeing this area. So Larry gets to oversee this garden and just this garden, knowing what works in it, really getting to have a little bit more overall say in designing the plants and scape. Of course, having a lot of people helping to maintain and manage this garden, rather than having them jump around to a bunch of different gardens throughout the park, he can focus his concentration on this area and make it as great as it can be. Having this type of zone management has been influential in our lawns, our gardens, and our woodlands, which today all have special teams like natural areas teams that care for woodlands, gardening teams that care for gardenings, and turf care teams that care for pastoral meadows and lawns. This, again, expert care has made the park look beautiful. And of course, there is never a dull season to explore the park, and our operations staff are constantly working in a joint effort to make all these areas look beautiful. While we might have some expert gardening staff making sure the inside of the garden looks amazing, we have plenty of incredibly dedicated operation staff that are making sure that your travels along the outside of the gardens as well are clear, even during winter snowstorms. Like this picture, which we can see that came from February 2021, during a more recent snowstorm we had just last year. One that dumped a lot of snow on Shakespeare Garden and all 843 acres of Central Park. Of course, thank you to our operations staff who are using machinery and plenty of human power out there, using a lot of their own strength to clear all the snow and break up the ice so it's clear and safe for us to make our way through the park. As we do also look back to the past, we can remember again just how far these areas have come. This is a picture from our Central Park Conservancy photo archives that show Shakespeare Garden sometime in the past. There isn't actually a date that we have for this photo, but we can presume it's probably from before the Central Park Conservancy formed around 1980. So this photo shows what you probably would have seen in these areas during the 20th century leading up to really the Conservancy forming. A lot of these large pits that contain flowers today were found empty, barren, and this landscape. Hard to even imagine that this is Shakespeare Garden based on what we have today. And of course, today, the beautiful blooms that overtake the garden are, again, just something that uh, 
again, completely surprise us when we look back at old photos of what the park used to look like. These, I believe, are um, still always bad on flowers. I believe these are some type of iris. When we look at them from above, we see, I think, the true beauty of these flowers. Um, iris is irises, the flower uh, family that these are part of. These might be Serbian irises, I'm not exactly sure. But the flower um, family that these come from, irises, is actually getting its name from the Greek goddess uh, of the rainbow, iris. Iris meaning rainbow in Greek, and actually um, said to be the name given to this flower because of their wide array of different colors that they can produce. So an interesting little flower to see here. As we do come down and make our way to our last location, I do wanna share one last poll, and this is a fun one. Um, so some of you may be familiar with Shakespeare and his fun little wording, um, certainly making up quite a few words, many words in which we still use to this day. You will find various different plaques throughout the garden, which talk about some of the quotes and mentions of Shakespeare's flora that he uh, mentions in his works. But Shakespeare, again, also mentions a lot of other words that he actually penned and coined, which would be the first time they were used in English language, and many of which are still used today. He created about 1,700 words, and you'll be surprised that a lot of them are very common ones that we probably maybe even use today. I'd like to uh, have you um, vote on which is your favorite Shakespeare word. And I know there's a lot of really fun Shakespeare words, but I included some simple ones just because... I included ones that I was most perplexed to learn. He actually coined and invented. Of course, there's some fun words like zany, um, but some of the words I included are, again, words we probably use very regularly, like downstairs and bedroom. I had no idea that William Shakespeare coined those words and was the first to use them. So I'll let everybody vote in these couple. If you do maybe even know a different word that he coined and you want to share it, maybe you can share that in the chat and let us know. As we come to our last stop, I do wanna share something that of course is a very um, fun area and fun building to see located just near Shakespeare Garden. And that is the building we can see pictured just along this small little walkway, which is the Swedish Marionette Theater or the Swedish Cottage as it's known today. Now this building was originally sent over from Sweden and it was sent to be used for the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia that was held between May 10th and November 10th, 1876. It was the 100th anniversary or the centennial of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, sort of like an early, um, sort of like a World's Fair basically held over in Philadelphia. So we do see a lot of different exhibitions like a legitimate authentic Swedish cottage being sent over from Sweden and constructed at this fair. When it would come time to send it back, didn't really want to go through all the work of deconstructing it and sending it back to Sweden. So Sweden actually donated it to the United States. And we see this being something really appreciated by Frederick Law Olmsted, designer of Central Park who attended the exposition, who thought it would make a lovely addition for Central Park. So we do see eventually it being sent back to the park the year after in 1877, and I believe it was deconstructed and reconstructed here, but making a fun little addition in the park. It would eventually become used as the uh, 1947 theater for the Marionette Cottage. We actually see this picture of it being situated in the park around 1880, which is coming from the Museum of the City of New York's Digital Archives showing that this has been a fixture in the park for quite some time and still holding up quite wonderfully. Around 1947, we would see a theater productions beginning, utilizing this cottage, but in 1973, a permanent theater being added to this. And today, this is primarily used as the Marionette Theater, which is operated by the City Parks Foundation Puppet Mobile, which happens to be the oldest continually operating company of its kind. Really amazing to see. This building, of course, providing just a very amazing addition to Central Park and one that beautifully complements our views of Shakespeare Garden. As we take in the last views on our walk today, I would like to end that poll that I shared before. And it looks like we have some pretty uh, spread even results here. Um, as this poll ends, I will share the results in just a moment. And it looks like kissing actually is going to be the winning one at almost 30% of us. Again, I was so perplexed to learn about some of these words he invented. Some things I was kind of familiar with like critic, 
but I didn't know he invented again things like bedroom downstairs, eyeball, gossip. I see I accidentally put gossip on there twice by accident, but um, again, a lot of interesting words that you can find, and he created it upwards of 1,700. So check those out online, and I'm sure you'll find other surprising ones that you weren't familiar with. But as we come to the end of our walk again, we can enjoy this view of the Swedish cottage once more. And I do want to thank you again for coming on these walks, supporting us, the Conservancy, and for maybe even walking these routes again and taking in the beauty on your own speed. Here is that map of the route we walked today in case anybody would like to check out this route for themselves. You will see this uh, little wood chip path we walk down is not on maps, but you will just have to kind of keep an eye out for it if you do venture into the park. As always, thank you so much for your support, for tuning into these walks and making them lovely for all of us. We're of course gonna continue doing these walks. We'll be back next Wednesday at 1230, but also keep a look out for some of our upcoming virtual programs. We are gonna be launching different types of um, monthly programs like in June, we will be doing a uh, Celebrate Pride and an activism tour. We'd love to see you on. Uh, so keep an eye out for some of these different programs we have coming up. And we hope to see you both in the park in person, as well as virtually again. So from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, thank you so much for joining us. I am going to keep this open for a few more minutes to answer any questions we didn't have a chance to get to. But from all of us here at the Conservancy, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody.